So, Dr. Corrin, yes. Uh, like I said, you're, I, I, I know you're at NYU and at Michigan, but to all of us, you're a professor emeritus of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> you, along with Dr. Grossfeld, we have two of the most experienced and wisest pediatric surgeons with us. We look forward to well, what usually happens when you get to be our age is uh, you do hernias and orchid apexes and uh, don't get involved with big, complicated cases. My life has taken an opposite turn <laughs> of doing recurrent, recurrent, recurrent esophageal cases and rectal cases. Uh, what I did is, uh, if you can put those slides up, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, not the most complicated, but relatively complicated esophageal atresia, if we can get those slides. Yeah, hey, Mark, you see that? Okay. Give us one second here. So, um, Abdallah, you asked a question about, we're waiting for the uh, Adobe to reboot here, um, about the the Azagus. Yeah, I guess there was a question. We don't have, not via IR. Did it well, open? Well, yeah. open yeah, yeah, it. Has anyone done that here? That's why well, I asked, because I, I there, it was uh, uh, it was Kazi had said, why Azagus. not the Azagus? Mm -hmm. oh. So, I mean, I've, I've, I've uh, I mean, I can imagine very unique ways of getting there, yeah. but that's why but I wanted but this to know. Is, this, I'm telling you, this is a lot simpler. It's a pretty easy procedure, and it's, it, to me, it's, it seems, everybody gets anxious, but it seems really safe. And someone asked where I do the uh, puncture in the neck, and I do it just like you're doing an IJ. Basically, go where you're going to go for a supraclavicular stick of the IJ. If and you tear the, you know, you, that's very slick, and it looked very nice. If you tear the pleura, would you continue having opened up a free space for it to bleed? I would. That would be my I, I might put a second port in to hold pressure if I have to, but I would. You would just... I, w I would. So what do you think the chances are of perforating the right atrium in getting access? In getting access overall or getting access this way? Getting access that way. I think it's very low because you know where the tip... You, I think it's lower than if you're doing it totally blind. You know where the tip of your needle is and you see the guide wire go. And again, once you, have at, once you get that blood back in, I haven't seen one... It's clawed, the azagus, it always reconstitutes at the azagus. So I call it, I, I call it right atrial puncture. You know, it's a little dramatic, but it's really S, SVC at the azagus. Right. So it's, it, yeah, that's what it struck yeah. me as. I've never done that, yeah. uh, but uh, probably never will. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like we're back up. Uh, I don't see Mark, but I'm thinking that we're good to go. So um, Okay, uh, can we see that next slide? Yeah, do I, so do I move it? see if the clicker works, Mark. It may not. We need Mark to come sit down here. Yeah, the clicker is not catching us. So, so Dr. Corn, we'll advance your first slide, but I can probably... Uh, Mark, can we get that first slide advanced? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, it, we can't talk about uh, esophageal atresia without putting this slide up of Cameron Haight, just to remind everybody. Uh, Cameron Haight was a thoracic surgeon at uh, Michigan, an adult thoracic surgeon, and we all know did the first esophageal atresia repair in 1941 and did manage to do over 300 cases during his career. Next slide. Can we? Can we oh. Yep. Okay. Uh, these are the things in, in uh, 2014, uh, in my mind, that I think are the major areas of interest when we're dealing with esophageal atresia. I think the most complicated form of esophageal atresia today, the one where we see the most complications, is the long gap pure esophageal atresia. Uh, the I put down as the second item here that we got to address, and that is the H fistula, not a pure H fistula, but the how common is a proximal fistula in a standard <laughs> esophageal atresia? Can the audience give me a rough idea of what they think the incidence is today? Okay, so um, do, you, do we have that? Let me ask the panel here. Okay. What do you think the incidence of a proximal fistula is in a child with a standard? Distal esophageal atresia, with esophageal atresia and a distal fistula. And it was published, I hey, think. Hey, Mark, Mark, can we go back to the slide that shows the question? Yeah, thanks. 1% was what uh, was published through that Australian series there you go. 20 years ago. Yeah. You, you think, you think that's increase. correct? No. 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 It's higher. higher. It's probably higher. What yeah. do you think it is? 5%. The audience? I, I think it's about anywhere from other reported cases uh, from other series. Any, we're as low as 2% to up to 9% in one series. I think it's probably 10% now, and the, and the best series was the one from Netherlands, showing that the incidence is much, much higher than we think. And that's extremely important because uh, I don't know that everybody 
fully evaluates the upper pouch adequately in order to uh, uh, determine whether there's a fistula there. So I'll ask the panel here, uh, how do you evaluate the upper pouch before you go ahead and do a standard esophageal atresia? What do you do to uh, rule out an esophageal fistula in the upper pouch? Richard Bronkowski. Is it Bronkowski? Bronkowski. Bronkowski. Okay. Does anybody use any other techno uh, techniques? So, Mark, can you advance the slide? I've or give us the clicker. Do we have it? Hey, Ernie, uh, you have the uh, clicker there. there. Oh, I have it now. Yeah, it's the top important. one? Yeah, uh, far right. No, far right. Far right one. Far right. Far right. Uh, okay. Okay, so the incidence is really about 10%, and that's the best study, as I said, is from uh, the Netherlands a few years ago. And you're saying uh, it's 10% in type C or pure atresias? Uh, in, in an esophageal atresia with a distal fistula, what do you think the incidence of the I, I think that's high. I, th I think it's. I think that's think way it's, too. I don't think it's that high. I think I, it's. I think in pure esophageal atresia, the incidence is much higher than we thought. And I think yes. If you have a pure esophageal <laughs> atresia, you have to look for the proximal fistula. But I think if you're, you're doing a type C, and I was just with Ed Kiley for the last five days, and we sort of had this discussion, he agrees. The incidence is so low, I think the incidence is much lower than that in a type C. Well, the numbers that I'm. Uh, uh, looking at are the numbers from this, uh, the uh, Netherlands study. Uh, but the point of the question is really not whether it's 10 percent or whether it's 5 percent. It's not 1 percent. It's much, much higher. And for that reason, one has to absolutely prove you don't have it. Now, the pure atresia is higher than the standard C-type of uh, soft deal atresia. But the key thing is uh, you don't want to miss that upper fistula. And I think everybody should do a bronchoscopy, but in addition, I often will get a uh, pouch pouchogram, which everybody thinks is old hat. And if we can get uh, one of the next slides. Uh, does the clicker work? If not oh, here, yeah. get it to me. I'll see. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to show a picture here uh, of a pouchogram. There it is. And the pouchogram is still, I know Mac Harmon will probably <clears throat> critique me for being an old fart in, in getting that. <laughs> Uh, but I always did those uh, in, when I was uh, chief of surgery at Michigan uh, because it helps you in two ways. One, you can see whether or not you have an upper fistula. But two, if you're not able to get cardiology uh, evaluation in a timely fashion, you can determine what side the aortic arch is on with a good pouchogram. So it's a very helpful study. And in my own experience, I've seen a fistula missed by an experienced pediatric surgeon doing bronchoscopy that was eventually picked up with a pouchogram or with a repeated uh, bron uh, bronchoscopy by, by myself at the time I did the case. So I think uh, you want to be sure you rule out that upper fistula. I think, I think you can uh, get I, clues to I, that. Barney, yes. May I ask you a question, Ben over here? Yes, Ben. Uh, what do you think is the sensitivity and specificity of your pouchogram? That's one. Did you miss? Are you sure you always see the fistula? And the second is, do you see some aspiration of your contrast media? Because we saw in former times, we saw that from time to time, and that was the reason not to do it. Yeah. Why well, would you comment on that? Uh, one, we usually put about a cc and a half, so the risk of uh, aspiration is small. The other thing you want to look for on that pouchogram is not just whether or not you see the fistula, but if you don't actually demonstrate the fistula, if the upper pouch is narrower and smaller than you normally see, you should be suspicious that there is a fistula and be more uh, uh, insistent on trying to prove it's there with either repeating the bronchoscopy, even repeating the pouchogram. And, as you, okay. and so that, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a good question, but I don't think that's a risk with a small dose of uh, water-soluble contrast. What was your other question, Benno? That was the two. That were the two questions. Sensitivity. Did you miss a, a, a fistula by the pouchogram, or are you always sure to find it? Uh, I don't recall. I mean, if I see a, uh, a fistula with a bronch bronchoscopy, obviously I won't get the pouchogram. So I can't say if I ever missed one. I don't think so. Okay. I was going to say, I think <clears throat> to your point about it being narrowed frequently, not, maybe not frequently because it doesn't happen that often, but I think you can get an idea just on the plain film. And typically, before we shoot the initial x-ray, we shoot air into the yeah. tube in the pouch. And if I don't see a big dilated proximal pouch, then I'm very concerned about that, a proximal That's a very good point. 
and I, th I think that's that's also helpful. But I'd still probably do a study. Do a study anyhow. Have you ever injected um, into the pouch while you're doing the bronchoscopy to see if you can demonstrate a fistula? Well, it, it, in under different circumstances, if you're dealing with uh, going to the OR to do an, an H fistula without a softula atresia, we'll often use what's called the methylene blue study to see if we can get dye to go through. Uh, but in a standard esophageal atresia, or especially a pure esophageal atresia, you, you don't do that. Um, at any rate, um, what I wanted to move on to from uh, the upper pouch and the uh, fistula is to the issue of long gap esophageal atresia and what the management of that should be today. Uh, I'd like to ask the audiences, if you have a full-term baby born with uh, pure esophageal atresia, you have... Uh, uh, ruled out an upper pouch fistula, and you uh, are concerned about what the real gap is, uh, what do you do to evaluate that uh, in terms of uh, studies to see whether or not it's a significantly long gap, small gap, and then determine when you uh, decide to go ahead and operate on the baby? With a pre-existing G-tube in place? You put a G-tube in place in the first 24 hours, yeah. So what we do, and Marcus can confirm this, is we, uh, we take them to an interventional radiology and uh, do contrast studies and then also put uh, probably a Bakes dilator in from the G-tube site. Uh, yeah, when, I, when I take them to the OR on that first one, I do the G-tube because they all need a G-tube. I have fluoro there and do the Bakes dilator up the, uh, up the lower. Can I ask both softness. of you, what do you think the probability is with the Bakes dilator that you get into the lower segment? So you have to be careful, and what you can do is you can take a little spaghetti uh, scope, and uh, you can like a little spaghetti bronchoscope, and you hook it up to a little insufflation air to give a few puffs if you if you really have a hard time finding it, so you can see the esophagus. Because I've been fooled, you can push the fundus up, correct, and be really fooled that you're a lot closer. You can push that thing way up there and think you have a short gap, and then you find out that we uh, do the same far thing apart. with the scope. But that's also one of the reasons we do it in interventional radiology because you can inject it and see that you're actually in the tubule, in the the, the <clears throat> distal pouch as opposed to in the fundus of the stomach yeah. and just pushing it up. Yeah, I, I think that uh, in fact probably the times that you end up pushing up the fundus of the stomach, which is like a rubber balloon in a baby, all the way up into the left chest. Uh, as I say, uh, you can almost get it up to the kid's nose if you want to when you're pushing. Uh, and think you have a good, a short uh, gap is very, very high. It's a pre-op study I think for your gastric transposition. What's that? Yeah. It's a pre-op <laughs> study for right, gastric right, transposition. Right, right, Hopefully you won't have to do it with all long, <laughs> these long gaps. But I think the important thing in my mind is you've got to visualize that lower segment. What I like to do is put the neonatal gastroscope in, and when you put it in and see how small that GE junction is, you're amazed that anything would go in blindly. Now, I won't argue that maybe you can blindly get a Bakes dilator in, but I think most of the time you can't. Mm -hmm. The other thing about a contrast study, do you think you see the full extent of the lowest segment with a contrast study, Matt? No. No, you don't at all. So putting the scope in, in the OR, under fluoro, yeah. where you drive your scope up and the upper pouch right and then there. you push down, that yeah. is your best way to assess That's, gap. Absolutely. I agree. Now, and then, then what do you do now? You've got a baby that you've measured the gap on. What, what gap is reasonable to go ahead and do the But you do, that, you do that on day one when you put no. the G-tube in? No. Because that's what you're saying. You take yeah. the kid to the OR, you <clears throat> try to put a G-tube in, and with that delicate stomach, you're trying to ram a scope in a not a ram. <laughs> well, but it is. I mean, you it's have a limited ram. access. You have a, a, a and small if it's a, if it's a tiny little baby, I'll wait. If it's a bigger baby, and I'll And to be honest, you don't have yeah. to know it that first time. Right. Exactly. Right. 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 So how many, you know. how many, when would you wait to do that study, the, the initial the initial I wait at least three weeks. Yeah. I, I want the gastroscopy. So after you put the gastroscopy yeah. 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 My experience has been these babies are all mostly two kilos or smaller. Yeah. Right. And they got to eat and grow a little bit before you I, I think if you try to put even that little tiny pedi neonatal scope in before three weeks, you're going to push the stomach away from the, the gastrostomy site. And as Max said, you, you're, not you're not forced do to anything do anything. You're feeding them by gastrostomy anyhow. So now you're at three weeks and you put the scope in and you uh, definitely get it into the lower segment. Uh, you got a little bougie in the upper segment. What is a reasonable gap between the two to make you decide you're going to fix the kid right then and there or the next day or two? Steve? Well, I, I mean, anything 
my experience has been part of it depends on how big the upper pouch is. I think the bigger the upper pouch is, the more likelihood you have of getting it together. So if I have a big dilated upper pouch, if I'm doing this at, at two or three weeks after the study and, and the gap is less than, um, certainly if it's three or less vertebral bodies, so I'll put it together then. Certainly two vertebral bodies is, is the classic teaching, I think, of, of something that you're probably going to be able to get together. Jay, what would you do? Yeah, three vertebral bodies, I think, is stretching it maybe a little bit. Literally. Uh, my, I guess one of the questions you have to ask it about that proximal pouch, does it grow by itself or do you have to dilate it? That's always a question that people talk about, whether you have to do anything if you, except just watch and see if it grows. And, and be patient. I don't I'll, think you need to rush to do this in the early neonatal period at three how, weeks. How patient should you be? Oh, I, I'd wait 12 weeks to stretch. I, I see nothing beside that. Babies grow pretty good with gastrostomy feedings in between. Parents learn how to handle the upper pouch at home. If they're intelligent parents, you have to discern that, of course. If they're not, you have to keep them in the hospital. That's a problem. Let's, let's say the, uh, when you measured the gap, uh, it was four vertebral bodies. At three weeks. Aggressive observation. I, I still think a little observation wouldn't hurt for another few weeks, but... Would you do a Foker maneuver? No, I don't use the Foker operation. I, I know there are people who think it's a great thing, but... And I know they don't get any complications when they write about it. But, you know, I've fixed a couple of Fokers. And I'm sure everybody in this room has seen a, a post-operative patient who's had a Foker procedure that came and it was a failure. We'll have massive... G reflux and aspirated. Uh, I, quite frankly, I don't like the Foker procedure. Mm -hmm. And if those kids are followed out 10 and 20 years, their esophageal motility and their esophageal function may not be very good. Worse than the usual esophageal atresia patient. I, I don't like the Foker procedure right, so, personally. So if you don't do a Foker maneuver and you've got four vertebral body <laughs> gap, let's say, at three months, that magic number that we picked to say we're going to try to put a pure treasure again uh, together, what, what would you do now? Well, our teaching at the, in the past was that you shouldn't try to do a replacement until the kid is upright so they don't reflux, because all the replacements usually reflux. And so it, either they have to be able to sit frequently or are up walking somewhere between 6 and 12 months to do a, a replacement procedure. I know it's being done earlier by some, and uh, we, we still like uh, the colon in a position, but a gastric pull-up would be a reasonable alternative. And if you asked our friends in the Netherlands, a jejunal in a position might be the way to go. So let me use that. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I would like to, and then I'll come back to Dan. Um, Benno uh, or, or Philip over in Europe, um, how are you managing these long gaps? I, would, I usually wait three months, uh, as it was said, and I would also, with four vertebra, I would try to get an anastomosis, and if not, we would switch to the gastric pull at, at, at three or four months? At three or four months, yes. Philip, Go ahead and do it then. So do people think, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have as much experience as those in the room, after three months, you don't think it's going to grow? You, if you wait another three months, you don't? No. Do, I mean, does that work? Or wait, by that time... That's a great question. It's, yeah. Is it done? Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, I, it's I, the lore. I, yeah, I've, I've done you know, I, I, by myself. I, I don't think anybody knows the real answer to that. I think yeah. most of us sort of believe that at about three months, you shot your load, and it's not going to get any bigger. And how does it get bigger? It either stretches or it grows. We don't even know that. And that's why we don't know what the focal maneuver really does. But I think at three months, you sort of have to make a decision. Yeah, we and do sequ sequential gap studies, and if we don't see it changing anymore, right. then you're waiting longer. We, yeah. I don't think it's worth doing because you're not getting any change with yeah. your... I uh, usually do a gap study every three weeks after we've done that initial one at three weeks mm -hmm. uh, since the gastrostomy site. Okay, so now you got this, uh, not a three vertebral body gap one, but you got the four vertebral body gap that unfortunately didn't cooperate with you and uh, and get lesser during that period of time. Are you going to go operate on the kid at that time? Yeah, we reported our, the first three cases of reverse gastric tube 
without spit fish till between three and six months. And I've done that three or four times and followed those kids. I think if you go longer than six months, you should probably put a spit fish in because the child will never eat if you go too long with waiting on the uh, proximal pouch to grow. So that's been a pretty so, good experience for us. So if you put a spit fistula in a kid at any point, even at three weeks, three months, you're committed to a replacement. Yeah, I don't. I haven't done a spit fistula in f 15 years. So is there any way of avoiding doing a spit fistula, a, a um, avoiding doing a spit fistula in a subsequent replacement at three months with a four of a deeper body gap? Gastric tube. We would. No, not put, yeah. without doing a replacement. I said. Well, in other words, you're you have a child that's three months old. You had, a, you had a, maybe a five vertebral body gap when you started. It got down to a four, a little less than a four at three months. You don't think it's going to grow anymore. You decide you're going to have to do something. Is there a way of not doing a spit fistula and then a subsequent replacement or just a replacement at that time? So you still have the option of a foker of some sort. And so I've yeah. had several cases where I've done thoracoscopic internal fokers, not, right. with, the, not with the sutures just coming attack. out but just around the ribs, and you go back thoracoscopically every two weeks and tighten it, and I've been able to get a primary repair in that exact scenario using what I call an internal foker approach. What was the gap when you started? About four. About four. Anybody else have that experience? I've well, done that as well. Is uh, there anything... Through an open thoracotomy. I'm not as sophisticated, maybe, thoracoscopically, but you could... Is there anything else you can do to save that esophagus? We... I would do a segmental colon interposition just to bridge the gap so that you maintain the distal esophagus. So you haven't really saved the, the full esophagus, though, if you do that. Well, you just you bridge the gap. So okay. I don't take out the distal esophagus. I would sew to the proximal pouch and to the distal. So we haven't sacrificed any esophagus. But is there any way to save that actual esophagus and get an anastomosis? Get a primary anastomosis? Yeah. I would do what Mac has described. So two things. Number one, we have th less than three minutes oh, left. Oh, sorry. And um, it's a ton of questions. So even after we finish, if the uh, faculty can some sort of address these uh, issues, We're, we don't have enough time to go on the air, but if you could address some of these questions. So keep going with your... Can I, can I make one point about this? Because I think it is an important uh, alternative if you don't want to sacrifice the esophagus. If you go in at three months mm -hmm. and you've got a four vertebral body gap, there is a way of getting the two ends together. And it's a paradigm. I didn't bring the slide because it was a long slide. And that is you can go in and prep the child with the right neck, the right chest, the belly, and the arm in the field. You can start off with a standard uh, thoracotomy, right thoracotomy, retropleural, transpleural to me makes no difference in this day and age. You go in and you mobilize completely the upper pouch because Steve is right. That's an incriti critical factor in being able to get any good anastomosis. You got that fully mobilized up to the thoracic inlet. You go down and mobilize the lower pouch all the way through the crura from the chest. That'll give you more room. If that doesn't work, you can't get it together, what I do is I open the belly. I take down the phrenoesophageal ligament in the abdomen and get that thing to be very mobile. And I've got the chest open at the same time and I see if I can get it together. If that doesn't work, what you can do, and I've done this a few times, is take down the short gastric vessels, the gastro, the left gastric vascular pedicle, bring, you'll get a lot of room that way, you get a couple of centimeters, bring that esophagus with a little bit of the stomach up into the chest, do an anastomosis, go back into the belly, and uh, secure that GE junction below the diaphragm. And if you do that, uh, if you try to do that and can't do it, what you can do is then proceed with a right through the right chest with a gastric transposition. So in one operation, you can solve the child's problem. Ultimately, it may be a replacement with stomach, but you, in many of the cases that I've done, you can get the two ends together. All right, can we do, so, in the 30 seconds left, um, rapid fire questions? Because we have a ton of questions from the audience. We're not going to be able to get to them. Okay. Uh, well, so Matt, so, Matt Clifton, I'm starting with you. Right aortic arch, do you go left or right? Left. Lou? Left. Right. Left. 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 Okay, I would go right. Left. Right. 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 Okay, I think we got a split. Can I ask the, uh, the panel here, how many have gone with the right aortic <clears throat> arch into the right chest, and what did they find? I've done it. Yeah. Was, was, it, was it fun? 
yeah, it's, that's why I said yeah. what. <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, the, the you point do, is... You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Yeah, you can absolutely do it, but it's not yeah. fun to do. No, yeah. you're right. Uh, any, so, any role for a collis gastroplasty? It's kind of... You mean... For in, your in technique that you just described. Out. It is almost yeah, a collis. It's, it's been described. I've not done that. I'm so, worried about that. So the other, the other thing I've done in that is if you have a dilate, really dilated proximal pouch, I have one kid that I did the, uh, the U over go, the proximal go pouch. Flap, go flap. And then, yeah. Is what it's called. And then just flipped it over and then did that. And the amazing thing was on the subsequent studies, it's like I thought I was going to have a kink or something. It looked, it looked fine. This, go, go, it's the go flap. It's the Bama or flap from Israel. There are a number of people who have done that. I, I'm worried about getting a bad stricture there when you do that. Does anybody think a myotomy adds length? Uh, so I, it was described to take tension off uh, what you thought was a tight anastomosis. It wasn't as limited as I was just with Ed Kiley, and he said they actually did a study and measured it before yeah. and after the myotomy. Yes. And it, it's a visual thing. It looks like it's longer, but it's yeah. not actually because the muscle <laughs> just constricts. Yeah. Not, not only that, but you have a risk <clears throat> with a myotomy, which you can, by the way, do it on both segments, if you want, mm -hmm. of getting into the mucosa. Right. Then you have a disaster. Yeah. All right. Dr. Coran, what age and size do you do that no. procedure on? Uh, which, which procedure? The one you described with where you do the thoracotomy. And the I, I, I think at three months, you got to do something. Okay. Okay. And I, so I'm doing at it about three months. Three or four. depends on when size I see the, the patient. Matt? Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Coran, the, the only other question I would have for you, based on that long gap that you described, people always talk about blood supply to the proximal and distal pouch. And, you know, there's this dogma about whether you shouldn't mobilize proximal or distal. And if you were to do that degree of mobilization on the proximal and distal, I think some people would raise the concern over whether there'd be a stricture related to vascular supply. Has that not been your experience? You know, I, what can I, you say about that? I think that's a misconception. Okay. Uh, I think the upper pouch, it's probably impossible to destroy the blood supply by fully mobilizing it. On the lower pouch, which is living off the segmental vessels coming in, I've never seen a full dissection all the way down through the crura result in anything that looked like ischemia or anything worrisome. And if you go back and read Dr. Gross's book in 1953, you'll see when he talks about esophageal atresia that if you can't get the two ends together, don't be afraid to dissect all the way down. Don't worry about the segmental blood supply. What about okay, reflux so after that procedure? You know what? We're gonna have to. We're gonna have oh, to. Sorry. We're gonna have to move on to give Steve a chance here. Sorry. <laughs> this is the way all these things work. This is just the way. So I said works. they all reflux. Yeah. So, so, you know. so yeah. like these questions that you just hit, type it in because you'll get the same amount of discussion in the chat box. Yeah. But then in, in Dr. Corn, you can even answer. So. Um, but one last question that I think is important. How many, <laughs> you're you're how cutting many into your own think, time. That's okay, because I think it's... How many people think you should save the esophagus no matter what? That was one question. Because I think yeah, that's the, the answer is no. You should not save the esophagus right. no matter what. And I think some of us get wrapped up in that. And, and I've, I've personally had one child who ended up dying at age 10 because we saved the esophagus no matter what. Mm -hmm. I yes. think. I believe that was... All right. yeah. let's, let's, yeah. Absolutely. You have to know when to quit. Yeah. All right, so Steve.